And the short of it, I'm going to argue the current approach from paleontology is mostly holistic. And it's all-encompassing. There's lots of details. And surprisingly, there's not been much of an attempt to ask reductionist questions. Right. So you could ask, suppose, we'll, what's the next picture? <laughs> okay. So I claim that El Nino can help us in this business because what El Nino has succeeded in doing is sort of marry oceanography and meteorology. And Bob and I, you know, so I have to be old enough to know what this meant, but there was a time if you ask oceanographers why as El Nino occurred, they say, oh, the winds collapsed. And if you ask meteorologists why did the winds collapse, they'll say, oh, it's the ocean sea surface temperature has changed. And uh, let's give one example. In, when the University of California system was started, each of the universities had a big department, physics, English, so on. Specialized fields such as oceanography, meteorology, were not at each of the universities. So Scripps gets oceanography, and Los Angeles gets meteorology. It never occurred to anybody they may want to talk to each other. <laughs> and, and the public, it, it, it's not a trivial <laughs> exercise to get them together. If I sit in the aeroplane and the fellow next to me wants to know what I do, I invariably say I'm oceanographer. You don't say you're a meteorologist, because these are rather tall people. <laughs> these are much more romantic people. <laughs> they explore the world. <laughs> and in general, laymen are very sympathetic towards oceanographers. Everybody is an expert on the weather, <laughs> can tell you. <laughs> and they become authorities on what you know most about. <laughs> so anyway, we need something similar here. And when I mentioned earlier, sort of trying to mix vinegar and oil, it, it's quite difficult to, if we're going to succeed in explaining the ice ages, get better models. I submit this will, uh, we'll have to marry these two approaches. We may need Hubert. So we, we can maybe we have to go back to the El Nino. If El Nino could do this, maybe they can do this again. So what's the, the next? Uh, that's just what I just said. Oh, so in the case of the ice ages, I said these hypothetical questions of not been asked. And I will claim that a problem with ice age studies is uh, it's often said in science that the, if you're faced with a problem, the most important step is asking the right question. Right? There's all sorts of clever people who can answer once you've posed the right question. So the first question was probably the one Milankovitch considered uh, why? what causes the ice ages. And I will claim that's actually, it was justified in Milankovitch's time, but it, that question has become intractable. It, it's, ice ages now involve so many different things, if you look at that graph earlier. It, it's not a good question. Uh, also, we have to get around this problem of lack of data and inconsistencies in the data. How do we bypass that? But I will claim that a better question to ask would be, what is the response to precisely known variations in sunlight? So the, the question has changed in the sense uh, here we know extremely well the response to the seasonal cycle. Right? And it immediately becomes a guide for how you could study the ice ages. So the seasonal cycle, if you give me 100 years of data, of temperature, rainfall, and St. Petersburg, there may have been some months, even years, when people didn't make any measurements. And you can bypass that by calculating a climatology. And so the climatology is an abstract that actually never occurs, but it's extremely powerful. Uh, a, it smooths the data. So now I know what should happen in typical January, February, and so on, even if there were months when no measurements were made in the January, February. Uh, secondly, now a note about it, it, it's very reductionist, that approach. You filter out weather. So weather is not in the seasonal climatology. You filter out El Nino. You're only dealing with this thing that's in response to a very precisely known forcing. And on that basis, you can make amazing predictions. So I cannot uh, tell you what the weather in St. Petersburg will be next week, 
I'm, I'm a great admirer of weather forecasts, but it has decided limits. It's not much good after a week or two. However, I can predict quite confidently what will happen three months from now, right, or six months, right? especially if I live in near New York. <laughs> I, I know what this terrible winter we're having is going to come to an end. And so, <laughs> so I can make long-term predictions. And then if I, from that perspective, if I just go back a slide or two, uh, another one, another one, to this one, What's in, what appeals to me about this picture is actually not all that complicated. And it's not that complicated because there are cycles that repeat themselves. And right, if I give you this picture and I ask you, suppose you take away the red spike, what will happen next? You have no trouble predicting it's going to be an ice age uh, in the next few millennia. Okay, so well, we should be optimistic. It, it can't be that difficult a problem except we've made it incredibly complicated by adding more and more details. So I don't want to offend anybody, but uh, there's not going to be any role for younger Dreyers or older Dreyers or Heinrich or Oscar Danskar or any of those things. Those are complications. We'll, we'll come back to them at some later stage when we've made advance. But the, the first job is just to explain, after appropriate faltering, what's going on here. So I should show you that I don't actually have a, I'm not going to give a definite answer to anything, but I think I have a strategy for how we can get to the solution. So I have a proposal. If you, so we can go forward again. Oh, okay. So we know the forcing exactly. And there are three numbers you should keep in mind. The, the three numbers is basically the tilt of the Earth's axis. It's called obliquity. And then there's precession. And precession is changing the timing of when we are closest to the sun. And the third is eccentricity. And they come up with three numbers, 20, 40, 100. Uh, have to keep in mind. The, the, and the simplifying thing about this in the next picture uh, is uh, this probably doesn't convey much information, but you just go back again. If, we, if I have a sphere and I change the tilt, I've not changed the net amount of sunlight the planet gets. All I've done is redistribute it in space. The tropics get more, the poles less. And on the other hand, if I change precession, if I'm closer to the sun some other time of the year, all I've done is redistribute sunlight in time. Uh, so precession is actually, I've made summers warmer, winters colder. So th these two components have entirely different physical structures, both in time and space. And we go forward one. And what this picture shows is just in latitude and time, what happens if you change the tilt. This is how sunlight will change. This is when you change precession. And now you can see what's the problem with Milenkovitch's hypothesis. So to Milenkovitch, glaciers are isolated objects in high latitude, and they respond to local sunlight. And he chose sunlight at 65 north in June, in the next picture. And the problem with sunlight at 65 north in June is you've thrown out all the information. <coughs> you don't take into account that a tilt has a completely different effect on a change in precession, right? Uh, because you're focusing on one place at one time. So we've actually handicapped ourselves with that approach. Uh, so that's why I say that this old question is not the right one. Uh, instead, this is the complicated problem we have to deal with. Uh, what I'm, what's the next picture? Okay, so, so there are three, these three signals, the one that is with sunlight and time, the one in space, and I'll say more about this for the second. Uh, I'll continue the next one. Okay, so if I come back to the story now, uh, a lot of work has been done. So let me summarize briefly. The work that has been done has been strictly glaciers. So you start here with no glaciers, but through plate tectonics, you change atmospheric composition, and it gets colder. An inevitable consequence of getting colder is that ice forms. So northern glaciers come into the picture here. And that introduces a feedback. Once you have glaciers, 
And what the glaciers do is, uh, they can, that feedback can do is two things. It can, in the next picture, yeah. So what the feedback can do, it can maintain a trend. Right. And if you go back a picture again, later on I'll have better ones, but you can clearly see it got colder. Okay. So take away all the Milankovitch forcing and the globe would have gotten colder. And at some point, uh, trends lead to thresholds. So the one thing, a glacier, once it's there, reflects sunlight. And so it deprives the earth of heat, so temperatures fall, precipitation is snow, the glacier grows. It reflects even more sunlight and so forth. It gets colder and colder. The other thing, if we go one step forward, is it can interfere with the obliquity cycle. That Suppose that next summer is slightly colder than the previous summer. The next summer, the snow that fell during winter, not all of it will melt. So if you repeat this, after a while it accumulates and you can have a glacier. But that depends on the seasonal cycle. You're assuming it snows in winter and it melts in summer. So it, it can amplify. So I want to emphasize these are separate things. You can have a trend if there was no Milankovitch forcing. And superimposed on the trend, you can have the cycle. Okay. And then what's striking about the record is, so we see from three to one million years ago, we see a trend and we see a superimposed obligate cycle. And I will submit these are independent phenomena. We fail to see a precession signal, sort of a puzzle. If you go at 65 north in June, most of the change in sunlight is due to precession. But if you stick to that variable, it doesn't tell you precession is very high frequency. Averaged over one year, there is no precession forcing. So it's at such a high frequency that the glacier cannot respond. Okay. So it's a bit like the dog that did not bark in the night. It's a vital clue. Okay. So it tells us we saw on the right track by distinguishing between obliquity and precession that it is important, it can explain why this is true, this is true. Now, at some point, this dictates what's going on. Glaciers get very large. They get so large they go unstable. Uh, ice is a good insulator, so geothermal heat from below starts melting the ice, and the glacier floats and breaks up. And then uh, it breaks up, and in due course, it holds it starts over. And it could start over because obliquity induces a, is a reduction or an increase in sunlight. You can see how obliquity can be dictate the timing of this thing. Timing depends. And you end up with a sawtooth signal because it takes longer to grow a glacier than it takes to melt it. Okay. So this, there's lots of work on this. It's an excellent paper by... Peter Hoybers, that summarizes this. So you can say we have a good understanding of glaciers. So the only flaw in this is we also know that CO2 changed, and that is thought to see not. So where does CO2 fit into this picture? And what caused the CO2 to change? And people here you know better than I do. You have to bring in the Southern Ocean, an exchange of CO2 between the atmosphere and the deep ocean. But the point is, glaciers suddenly are just members of more things. The other thing they find is that, one more picture. This is a record, this is the previous one. Now you see the trend much more clearly. By the way, notice the trend stops around here. And there's almost no trend the last million years. Because now you have the sawtooth. If you wonder why everything is backwards, paleontologists have the habit of plotting time to the left and I'm so determined to plot it to the right. <laughs> so I took their picture and PowerPoint allows you to do this. Uh, this is a plot of sea surface temperature. And it's actually a, this is by Herbert at Brown. And what I find intriguing is that the statistical properties are the same. So from this point onwards, sea surface temperature has 40 degree oscillations, superimposed on a big trend. Around here is another change. The trend stops, and now you get sawtooth signals. So what is most peculiar is that this plot 
is a, a plot of global ice volume. So it's an integral. And they've taken data from around the globe and come up. So integration is a good thing. It smooths. Uh, differentiation is the opposite. See, you couldn't ask for a more, I shouldn't use the word terrible, but um, a, a worse variable than temperature. Right? The sea surface temperature depends on, it's very local, it has huge variability in time, it has huge variability in space, especially in the Eastern Pacific. So given, and it's a highly nonlinear variable, if I write down an equation for sea surface temperature, I found it most astonishing that these things should have any similarities at all. Okay, so, and if you look at the next picture, I think, they, the, these are records. The top is from China caves, and it's mostly rainfall. And superimposed, I've put the precession signal. And it looks as if whatever goes on in China is relatively simple. Precession is dictating what happens. This is the record I just showed you, the ice volume. You see the sawtooth seems to have very little to do with precession. But strangely, this is sea surface temperature in the Pacific looks amazingly much like this, even though the forcing it experiences like that. Okay, so the sea surface temperature in the Pacific is quite astonishing in that it looks like the glaciers. So what I want to do briefly is make a quick case, go back to visit the El Nino family, and argue that the Tropical sea surface temperature patterns have processes, have mechanisms to explain. Let's go back. Uh, yeah, this one. I can explain these transitions without invoking uh, the glaciers. So, a little bit, if I study the seasonal cycle, I would study, say, monsoons in India is the big deal there. Uh, in San Francisco, it would be upwelling. It's very cold in winter because the water gets cold. The, I have completely different explanations for upwelling in San Francisco and for monsoons in India. And the two are correlated. And it's because they're both responding to something external. The mechanisms are different. And they connected in the sense that we are on a sphere. That's what happens in, what happens in India cannot be independent of everywhere else. And then the seasonal cycle has very odd properties. Uh, rainfall is very local. India it only rains in summer. Globally average, there is almost no seasonal cycle in rainfall. Globally average, there's almost no seasonal cycle in albedo, even though regionally they are big. So there are complicated connections between them that we don't fully understand. Whatever happens here is dependent on what happens elsewhere. And, but our first step in trying to understand that is to understand each one locally. So I'll briefly go through how the Pacific just considered on its own. I can explain this curve, I can explain these transitions without referring to glaciers until the late stage. Uh, let's go. And the reason you should think that the Indian Ocean should anticipate that the, Indian Ocean, that the Pacific Ocean can do things on its own are these records of temperature over the last several million years. So if you are in the Western Pacific, there's been no change in sea surface temperature. But if you go to the Eastern Pacific, it's gotten colder. So a place like Peru, you don't go to the beach today, but three million years ago it was quite pleasant. And then these other places, quite likewise. So all the upwelling zones on the planet did not have cold water until about three million years ago. So the appearance of the top picture, you may take it for granted, but if I, I, I argued earlier that the present is the most unusual time in the history of the planet, right? because we're sitting at the interglacial. We're sitting at a period of very energetic ice age fluctuations. If I ask you to step outside and look around what is so unusual about the planet today, then your first guess would probably be at we have ice caps at the poles, which is correct. We haven't always had that. Uh, however, if you're going to have ice anywhere, that's the place you expect it. What you would never anticipate beforehand is the top picture. You'd never expect cold water at the equator. Even Darwin, when he got to the Galapagos, was astonished how cold the water was. So it's a major puzzle. Why is the water so cold? 
uh, what is so special about the world today. So we go to the next picture. It's a consequence of the thermal ocean's peculiar thermal structure. That the only reason the, it's cold in the Galapagos is the thermocline is so shallow that if the wind blows the right direction, cold water comes to the equator. So I will claim that what we have to explain is why is the thermocline so shallow? Why isn't there more warm water in the ocean? It, it's quite astonishing if you go to the warmest part of the ocean, the date line at the equator, the average temperature is barely above 3 degrees centigrade. So there's amazingly little warm water. And I would claim that... What do I have next? Okay, so, so El Nino, the reason we made all the progress is it accepts, it takes for granted there is a shallow thermocline and then looks at this. It doesn't ask why is the thermocline shallow. Right? So you know, all the El Nino studies bypass a very difficult question. You, you build into your models that you have a shallow thermocline and then you look at other consequences. So there is another way if we go next. Uh, suppose I move the thermocline this way. Uh, if the thermocline were at 1,000 meters depth instead of 100, I wouldn't, wouldn't have El Nino. So I have to do this diabatically. So El Nino is adiabatic. It's just a horizontal redistribution of warm water. It has nothing to do with the flux of heat across the ocean. If I want the thermocline deep, I need to change the heat budget. So today the heat budget, this is where the ocean gains heat. This is where it loses heat mostly. And you can imagine this simple experiment. So in, in the long term, meaning several decades, the ocean must have a balanced heat budget. Right? What it gains here must be what it loses there. And then there's an interesting asymmetry. What it loses depends on atmospheric conditions. So this loss is mostly in winter when cold air comes over. But suppose we induce global warming and suppose there's no loss of heat in high latitudes, then the ocean, the tropics will not know, and heat will accumulate, and the thermocline will go down. Okay, so in a warm world, I would expect that the thermocline would actually be quite deep. Uh, in a cold world, you have to transport a lot of heat poleward, because in a cold world, there'd be a big loss here. So we, we did some experiments with a simple model, and indeed, you can control the tropics from high... You can control the depth of the thermocline from high latitudes. Okay, so I would submit... This is basically what obliquity can do for you. Obliquity changes the tilt. So if obliquity is high, you've warmed this up, you lose less heat, and you warm this up. Okay, so... Uh, and I call this one El Padre, La Madre. If we, so I can induce this and I can go back to my records and check. So I will claim that once around three million years ago, once cold water appears at the equator, this, is, this mode of transporting heat is available. And this makes possible a way of communicating.